Okay, it is now two minutes past the hour. We'll get going. Welcome everybody uh, to our ongoing series on uh, Safe at Work and helping our employers, clients navigate this very complex um, environment we're all facing with respect to the pandemic. Uh, at first, a year and a half ago, identifying all the issues about lockdowns and then coming back to work. And then slowly as we come through the various waves and vaccine policies and now, Obviously, we're dealing with another new and challenging situation, namely the vaccine mandates that we heard about a couple of weeks ago um, from uh, the administration. So uh, today we have a really exciting uh, group uh, cast uh, to talk about some of these issues. Uh, uh, we'll start with um, the legal implication of the mandate. Uh, and we have, and you've all met her before, Delphine O'Rourke, who's a partner at Goodwin. Uh, she has given us great counsel and our employers great counsel along the way with uh, respect to what we can see, hope, to, hope to see and how we should be responding. Greg Manser, our chief client officer, is going to talk about our COVID-19 testing options. And in particular, uh, we now have a new executive who's joined our team, our new medical director and VP for our Safe at Work program, Sean Lucan, who's not just a physician, but an epidemiologist, will be giving some of his insights on some of the, this new era of testing. And uh, the big message there will be, uh, this isn't what testing used to be like a year and a half ago. This has gotten to be much more uh, sophisticated and somewhat more challenging. And then finally, uh, we'll have the opportunity for our chief technology officer at DHE Health, David Buza, to talk to us about uh, the technology solution uh, that some of you already have, uh, but others don't with respect to our offering and our capabilities to help you navigate the set of complex problems. As usual, I'll be taking questions. You just have to mark them in. I will be taking them. I'll be the only one who's seeing them. They can be anonymous if you like. And then at the end of the session, which should last between 35 and 40 minutes, uh, we'll be, um, I'll direct the questions to all of the panel members. And um, of course, uh, our team is always available after the session to meet with anybody on this webcast individually. So with that, I'm going to introduce um, uh, Delphine Park O'Rourke to talk about the legal implications of the new vaccine mandate. Delphine, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, David, and thank you to EHE for including me in this panel um, as we have an ongoing conversations about COVID and COVID, COVID vaccinations. Who would have thought when you first invited me to join you on, on one of your webinars when the epidemic first broke out that we'd still be having these ongoing complex conversations and trying to work through the variety of laws that leave many employers trying to figure out how do I comply, what do I need to do, how do I do it, how do I do it legally and most uh, effectively. So today, Obviously, we're going to talk about the mandate, the announcement that came out two weeks ago. We are on September 9th regarding a, a part of a six point plan, Biden's six point plan. And today we're going to focus on the mandatory vaccine requirements for employers with 100 plus employees. Uh, we'll note that there are five other components, but this is what we're going to focus on it's most relevant for this audience. We were anticipating uh, it's Friday, however, it's not quite the end of the day that we would receive the final text of the emergency temporary standard that we're going to discuss today, either this week, if it's not this week. Um, thought is that it's going to be next week. So this is right around the corner, and we're going to talk about timeline. Um, really important that you focus on compliance and focus on complying quickly, because you're going to see this is going to be a very accelerated timeline. So what is OSHA? Because what we know from Biden's announcement is that OSHA is going to be enforcing the mandates. So OSHA, for those of you who are not familiar with OSHA, is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which has been in place since the 70s. So it's not new. That's some of what's swirling around. Oh, this is a new organization that's going to be enforcing. Not at all. OSHA has been around. And OSHA's mandate is to ensure safe and, um, and healthy working conditions for, for all workers. 
And um, you've probably encountered OSHA when it comes to maybe air quality, but many of you on this call, I imagine, have not had the exposure and experience with OSHA that companies in, for example, the manufacturing industry or the gas industry have had. So really important to focus on OSHA and OSHA's role. So if we move on, one of the big questions has been, well, what is the authority? Can President Biden really, or OSHA, really mandate a vaccine? And immediately after the announcement was made, there were, there were claims by governors, by private entities that there was no authority and that they were going to sue OSHA. Now, while the lawsuits might be brought, and we can talk further about this, OSHA does have authority to issue an ETS. So I think, unfortunately, sort of creating a distraction that isn't necessarily a priority for you when you're thinking about implications. Because even if there is a lawsuit, that lawsuit would have to go through the legal process, and it's going to take time. So OSHA can issue what is called an emergency temporary standard if it meets a two-part test. So that's where you see a lot of the conversation. So there needs to be grave danger. The test is there, you know, review it at your leisure. And it's necessary to protect employees from such danger. So the Biden administration is saying, yes, when we see these COVID increases, particularly in certain parts of the country, when we're seeing our deaths go back, go back to, to levels that um, we haven't seen for, for months, this is a grave danger and this is necessary. This emergency standard is necessary to protect employees from such danger. This is not new law. Okay, I think that's important because what I'm hearing from clients, they're saying, well, do I really need to comply because this is a, a new law, these ETS standards? No, they're not frequently employed. There was one issued, as you know, in June for healthcare facilities. The last one that had been issued was in the 80s, so not frequently used, but it is legal. So why do you want to comply? Because if you ignore the standard, you could face citations and penalties of up to 14000 per violation. So those fines can add up. More generally, well, first of all, you always wanna be compliant with the law. Um, also, if OSHA starts seeing that you have violations in one area, they can start looking at other areas. And like any enforcement agency, um, best to not have them looking at everything that you're doing um, if you can avoid it. You know, um, there's nothing else stop OSHA from saying, okay, well, you have issues in this area, and now you're on the radar as being non-compliant, particularly since, um, you know, confident that the audience here is compliant, is focused on OSHA, and compliance with other applicable laws. So 14000 per violation. So which employees will be covered? And we can talk more about how that calculation is made. All employers covered by the OSHA Act must comply. So that could be circular. So which ones are covered by the OSHA Act? If you have 100 employees or more, you will likely be covered. There are some exceptions um, run by Indian Affairs, um, other exceptions for specific carve outs. Generally though, it's safe to assume that you will be covered. If you have any questions about whether your particular services would be carved out, you know, feel free to reach out. But financial institutions, insurance companies, law firms, consulting companies, you are all covered, okay? And the thing is that most office-based employers, you know, OSHA is not front and center. If you are a demolition company, if you are, you're thinking about OSHA all the time. However, if you're a financial institution or an investment um, firm, you might not have OSHA front and center, okay? So if you have 100 employees or more, this will apply to you. So what, what can you do, right? You, in addition to all the other requirements that you need to comply with, now there's yet another requirement and you have a limited time frame to comply where once the final uh, ETS or when the ETS is issued, again, might be this week, might be next week, we anticipate that you'll have 75 days. Not that long to get an entire system in place, okay? If you have 50,000, 60,000, 10,000 employees, all of a sudden you're gonna have 45 days, uh, excuse me, a month and a half, 75 days, 
um, to have a system up and running so that you can be audited. So my suggestion is don't wait to get the ETS. Don't wait and, and try to wrestle through what the options are. Start thinking about it now. So five-step action plan for employers. Procedures. How are you going to determine the employee's vaccination status? You might already have procedures in place. Hopefully you do um, as you've been screening and making sure that you have a safe environment, right? The general obligation to create a safe environment for your employees comes out of OSHA, okay? So what are your procedures? What are your policies? If Once you have procedures, you need to make sure that you have policies. You might already have some in place, update them. Um, if you have a process that policies need to go through, get that going. It is easier to put a policy on hold than to scramble one together at the last minute that's legally compliant and that you can operationalize. This is a big one, okay? Under the ETS, you're either going to be able to mandate the vaccine or allow unvaccinated employees to be tested weekly and then provide you with proof that they have been tested. So that's a pretty significant decision at the outset. Which way are you going to go? And you're gonna hear more from, um, from our epidemiologists and, and physicians on this point. That's a key determination, okay? And if you are going to allow unvaccinated employees to be tested weekly, how are you going to track that? How are you going to make sure, weekly, you know, comes around awfully quickly. How are you gonna make sure you're doing so in a manner that is consistent? How are you gonna make sure that you do it in a manner um, that is non-discriminatory? You're, you're even if not intended, how do you make sure it's rolled out? What are you going to do about your remote employees? Okay. And if you've gone back to a hybrid presence, you need to make sure that you are on it for those employees. Maybe they come in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. How are you going to handle that versus your employees who are, who are remote? Have a plan and process for handling accommodation requests because the mandate still has exceptions, religious exceptions disability exceptions, okay? And you don't wanna run afoul of that. So you likely already have a process in place, need to make sure that the information that you have, if you know that, you know, Joe and Jane both have religious accommodations, make sure that in your system where you're tracking, let's say weekly testing, that that's reconciled so that you're not in a position where you're uh, penalizing in any way or not allowing employees to come in who have a bona fide um, uh, uh, exception. How are you going to track results? You know, um, my this is going to be a tremendous amount of data to gather. You need to have not only consistent policy and practice in place, make sure that you can track it in real time, and then prepare for your OSHA complaints and inspections. Particularly if you're not used to, if you haven't had a history of OSHA inspections, Make sure that you have designated people, that you have policies, that you have practice. When OSHA says we're coming on Thursday, that you are ready for OSHA to come on Thursday. So I'm going to hand it off and happy to take questions um, during this seminar. And EHE also has my contact information if you want to follow up afterwards. Thank you. Jocelyn, thank you so much for, for this brief overview. If you don't mind, I just would like you to emphasize something, and I, I don't usually do this in between, but I know it's gonna be a question. We've heard from so many employers that they think that there's an option that they could just let people stay at home and thereby not mandate or test. Would you just clarify uh, uh, that issue for all of the folks on the phone? Sure, and that's a great question because Biden's announcement was an overview. Okay, so we haven't yet seen the text and in his overview, and even if follow up, there's a press conference, a Q&A after um, following his announcement, there, there wasn't enough specificity in my opinion as to what you do with remote employees. And I didn't say remote employees will be included and they will be also included in your 100 employee calculation which led a lot of people to say, well, why don't I just leave them all at home and then I'm gonna get around this. So since that has been, since so many companies went to that, I think you can anticipate that in the ETS text, that'll be much more specific. Again, that hopefully we'll get this week or next week, it'll directly address employees at home and that attempted workaround. 
Now, also the other thing to remember is that the ETS could stay in effect for six months. Operationally, could you really work, and maybe you could, but could you really continue to perform with all of your employees at home for the next six months or remotely? They might not be, they might not be at home. Okay. Thanks so much, Delphine. All right, we're going to move along now to talk about the employer testing options uh, with Greg and Sean. Uh, Greg, thank sure. you. Thank you, David. And thanks, uh, uh, Delphine, and good to be with everyone this morning. You know, part of what uh, Delphine had shared in, in some of her comments was having a plan. And I think uh, the point we're really trying to emphasize uh, on the slide that you see here is uh, uh, it's not just important to have a plan with respect to your compliance, it's to really think about planning now, just given some of the incredible demand uh, that seems to be presenting uh, us right now in the testing landscape. Uh, we as an organization have been helping employers uh, do COVID testing, you know, going back to the spring uh, of last year. Uh, over the course of that time, we have seen some variability in supply. Um, and we're expecting the, the system to become even more strained. You see a couple of headlines here, you know, the Department of Defense awarding a contract for over-the-counter COVID tests. We're already hearing from suppliers we're talking to that, you know, they're coming in and swooping uh, up a bunch of rapid antigen tests in bulk. Um, there's a lot of activity going on. There's other large employers doing the same thing. And we've been having a lot of conversations with uh, uh, clients and, and prospects over the last few weeks uh, just as they start to get themselves ready and plan. So I would really encourage you to take Delphine's comments to heart, really start to think ahead. Uh, and part of what we want to do in this section here that uh, Dr. Lucan is going to walk you through is really give you a good overview and grounding in the testing uh, landscape and what to be looking for uh, in a COVID test, because this will very likely be something you're going to need to deploy in some way, shape, or form. So why don't we go to the next one, and uh, I'm going to hand it off to you, Dr. Lucan. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Um, so I, I just want to emphasize, as Greg said, I mean, supply is a big consideration, and flexibility is going to be key uh, as companies, you know, try to navigate these waters about testing options, and the variety is overwhelming. Um, there's an enormous amount of variation uh, in testing approaches available to companies. Uh, and sorting through that is going to take, you know, some expert counsel. So, you know, first and foremost is whether you're going to pursue a PCR molecular strategy or antigen strategy. This slide just, you know, basically summarizes some of the complexity here, but even, you know, the next point about nasal swab versus saliva, you can have a shallow nasal, deep nasal, nasal pharyngeal, the saliva can be a simple spit test. It can be a, um, an oral rinse or a, a, a cheek swab. So there's huge variation, uh, not least of which relates also to whether it's an over-the-counter test or point of care. Are people self-swabbing? Are they being observed? Is it a rapid turnaround on the course of minutes or does it take you know, hours to days with more um, you know, sensitive laboratory analyses? And then what the purpose of the test is, is it for surveillance, just to keep your finger on the pulse to understand sort of what's happening in your population? Or is it for diagnosis, identifying, um, you know, infectious cases and, um, you know, with, with the hope of isolating and removing them so they don't cause a bigger problem for the business? Um, and I think increasingly businesses are going to be looking for robust surveillance testing strategies. And I just want to emphasize how tricky that can be. Um, and on the next slide, I want to get into some of the nuance. If you want to go to the next slide. Um, you know, and, and this is a terribly busy slide, um, but I'm, I'm going to walk it through it and try to put it in language that everyone can understand, um, because I, I feel like these issues, um, you know, are, um, uh, are, are completely understandable, um, and it, sometimes they, you know, just get discussed in terms that, you know, make things sound sort of out of reach or, you know, too sciencey. Um, so let's just walk you through from the perspective of uh, a worker uh, at your company who has an experience with coronavirus. So I want you to focus on the blue line there, the, the curved blue line in the center. Uh, and we'll start right at day zero. So we'll say that's a Sunday night and your worker goes out to dinner with her husband and she's at the restaurant, she has a nice time. And it just so happens that at the very next table, there's a uh, fellow diner with coronavirus and your worker goes home with coronavirus in her nose. And unsuspectingly and without any awareness, that virus replicates, divides, increases, inside of her without 
her having any symptoms or any outward signs until, you know, maybe about three days later, she gets to a point where there's so much virus in her body that she's no longer able to contain it. She feels like she has to share it and she goes from being infected to infectious. So now she's a problem because now she's contagious and can share or spread her virus with others. Now at the top of the curve there, that's when the immune system starts to kick in. And if she were to develop symptoms, that would be about the time. Um, but if she doesn't, she remains asymptomatic and her immune system you know, starts to win the fight and the virus goes down sort of precipitously. And about a week later, she gets to a point where again, she's no longer infectious. So you know, she's contagious for about a week, but then she gets to this point where the virus is vanquished and all that remains are sort of dead viral particles and fragments laying around. Um, you know, kind of hanging out in her nasal passages. And you can see that line kind of trails off hazily. That's because there's an enormous amount of individual variation there. So the amount of time that a person can hold on to that virus can be, you know, on the order of a, a couple of weeks, or it might be a couple of months. I've, I've personally had a patient who was positive for over a hundred days. So that gets to the point about our testing approaches. So there are two listed on this slide over on the right, a, a PCR and an antigen approach. And these are just illustrative. There are other approaches, in, including combined approaches. But if we look at PCR, so PCR is sort of, you know, the quote unquote gold standard high sensitivity test. And that's because it detects a low level of virus. So let's say you were to initiate your surveillance strategy during this patient's, or sorry, this worker's week three, right? So during week three, she would have uh, enough virus to turn a PCR test positive, but that virus would be dead, inactive, inconsequential virus. So virus that's not a threat to anyone, not contagious, um, not a problem, other than the fact that it turns a PCR positive and now you have to deal with it. So you see that PCR positive and now you either have to isolate that individual or shut down her unit or quarantine a large group and there are real implications for the business. The other problem with PCR is that it's an expensive test. And as a consequence, it's done pretty infrequently. Um, and so you might do a PCR strategy only once a week. And so if you go, uh, you know, sort of to that first week there, um, uh, a little past day zero, you can see, you know, your patient was infected or exposed on that Sunday and you do your testing on Wednesday. Now on Wednesday, there's not enough virus to turn the test positive. So you get a negative result appropriately, but then you don't test again for a whole nother week. And so for that week, that person is growing the virus and is infectious, is contagious, is in the worker population undetected and causing a problem. And you don't even look for it again until a week later. The other problem with the PCR is that generally it takes a day or two or sometimes three or four to come back. So you don't get the results immediately. So in the case here of testing during week one, there wasn't enough virus available um, and it tested negative, but you get that result two days later. And two days later, that person actually is infectious. That person actually is contagious. That person actually is a threat and you're getting the wrong information. Similarly, the next week when you test them, well now, uh, uh, week two, David, um, right there, yeah. The next week when you test them, that person will test, you get the results two days later. When the test was done, that person is infectious or contagious. But when the result comes back, um, at that time, the person is no longer a threat, no longer a problem. And, and yet again, you get a positive result and have no choice but to isolate that person or quarantine a unit or shut down operations. And there are real implications for the business. So an alternative to that, so you can see in the line above is a rapid antigen test. Now, rapid antigen is not as sensitive. It's not able to detect low levels of virus, but it's able to detect virus when you care about it, when it's infectious, when it's contagious, when it poses a threat to others, when people can share it. And because you can do it rapidly, you get results immediately when you need them, when the information is needed. You don't have to wait a day. You don't have to wait two days. Um, you get the results immediately, and if a person's positive, you send them home, they don't cause a threat to anyone or, or any of their coworkers. The other thing is that because it's cheap and because it's rapid, you can do it on a regular basis. You can do it, in this case, three times a week, and all three times you get the correct result and a result that you can intervene on, and that results in good uh, things for both worker health and worker safety, and you're 
bottom line. Um, and you don't get bad information. So, you know, I, I think a bottom line is that testing is tricky. Uh, testing has nuance. There are many different approaches. Choosing the wrong approach is not only uh, a problem for worker safety, but it has business implications. It has implications for productivity and for profits. Uh, and sometimes what's thought of as the best test or the gold standard test isn't actually the best option for a company moving forward. Uh, and, you know, like, like I said, there, there are an enormous number of options and they're only growing by the day. So it really helps to have someone who's an expert in this and who's seen it, who's, you know, lived it in real time uh, to sort of walk you through and help come up with a strategy that works for, you know, the company moving forward. We can go to the next slide. Thanks. So, um, you know, just to kind of close this part of the discussion out, we do think it's helpful to have a testing mindset. You know, I, I talked a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the supply chain challenges uh, uh, that uh, we're, we're looking here, uh, you know, just based on what Dr. Lucan shared, you, you want to think about the, the timeliness of the tests and, and how it is helping really address your workplace safety strategy. Um, but, uh, but being flexible is really critical right now. Um, and it, it is helpful to, to make sure you're working with testing partners uh, that have more than one testing option. You just don't know what's gonna happen with the supply chain. It's not all about demand either. Some of the manufacturers have had just production problems, delays. There have been other industries affected by just some of the, uh, those types of issues as well, as you all know. Um, having some rules and some guidelines is really important. Um, we work a lot with clients and really just helping uh, frame out what the approach is, um, how to address those positive cases, uh, and having the right kind of processes to handling them. You know, it's, it's one thing to administer a testing program, um, but you know, what we've learned over the course of the pandemic and working with clients is positive cases can generate uh, a lot of anxiety and concern. You, so you wanna make sure that you are not getting uh, too carried away. You're just really thinking about the right way to handle it. You have those procedures in place and everyone knows what to do. And supporting your workforce is really gonna be key here. Some of them may be confused by why they need to do the test, helping them understand the context for why it's required, but also uh, you know, what to do when certain things, uh, results are produced, positive, uh, et cetera. And then lastly, you know, the, the comment um, uh, uh, Dr. Lucan made about just the, the, the testing and the business implications, uh, we know if uh, as a weekly testing requirement surfaces, that starts to become quite a, a, a costly proposition for an employer. Um, uh, there's clearly an opportunity to promote vaccination there. That's a good business strategy, but I think it's also just a good healthcare strategy for your population. So when you're thinking about uh, your, your overall approach here to uh, complying with the mandate and, and having some type of testing program up and running, don't lose sight of the opportunity that you as an employer uh, have to really get your workforce vaccinated, take that cost out of the system, but also improve their health. So um, why don't we jump to the next section? I'm going to hand it off to David Buza, who is our uh, chief technology officer. He's going to talk a little bit about how we've been working with uh, companies um, uh, you know, around uh, a testing process and, and uh, what some of those uh, learnings are. So David, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Greg. And, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I th thought it'd be helpful just to, to kind of bring it back to some of the, the points that Delphine was making um, to talk a little bit about how technology can help support um, uh, collecting the, the information that you need um, uh, and the data and having that available um, to ensure that you're you're compliant with some of the the, the rules that are coming down the line. Um, so so David, if you move on to the the, the first slide here, um, you know, what what we've put in place and, and we think that uh, you know certainly what we've done accommodates this, but any any program um, that you implement will need to accomplish these steps and, and really tie back uh, directly to those five points that um, uh, that Delphine was making earlier. Um, but you'll, you'll need to be communicating uh, out uh, your vaccination and testing requirements once those are, are uh, divined and determined by your teams. Um, uh, there's going to need to be a process for registering your, um, uh, your employees in a, in a simplified manner that brings them into that um, 
where they're able to track their vaccination status and um, and understand for those that are not vaccinated, if that's part of, uh, if there's a, a not going to be a mandate at your uh, company, um, that you're in a position to accomplish the testing um, that uh, that uh, is going to going to be required. Um, part of what we do is um, a digital consent that uh, makes sure everyone is clear on the components of that on that program, and then we help deploy um, a vaccine verification uh, capability and bring that into uh, our testing, uh, marry that with our testing capabilities as well. What's really um, you know critical is ensuring that everyone in your workforce um, is clearly delineated uh, whether they are uh, confirmed as vaccinated and there's uh, there's data around that um, whether they have put in uh, a request for an exemption uh, if that's something that's part of your um, your program and then lastly the individuals that are going to require that regular testing uh, that we're expecting from the, the from the ETS rule that uh, Delphine was describing, uh, that there's clarity of who's in that camp and that we have the ability to put them into that regular cadence and see evidence um, that uh, would be visible uh, around the completion um, and the sharing of that testing result back with the employer. Um, so critically, uh, obviously technology can play a big role in this um, and the ability to have um, a real-time access to that is obviously important when you're talking about the kind of speed of testing uh, that is available with some of the newer tests um, or with tests that are coming back from a lab, making sure that that information is available as soon as possible um, and making sure that you have full coverage of your entire workforce. Um, so that capability is really a, a, key, a key component that uh, you should be thinking about in any program uh, you put in place. Um, the, the last slide I wanted to share is just a little detail for this audience about some of the components that, that, uh, that we've implemented. Um, we've really combined uh, the capabilities that we've delivered throughout the pandemic, and, and, and Greg alluded to these earlier, but we've done tens of thousands of, of COVID tests um, for our clients um, throughout the pandemic uh, for essential workers and others. Um, and we've combined that with our vaccine verification capability, um, which is unique in that we are able to access the state registries to understand a person's vaccination status um, that uh, does not rely on uh, paper cards. And, and obviously everyone has heard about um, issues of, around verifying those. Um, we also have put in place a program where engaging with employees is quite simple. So. Uh, we focused on a, a text-based approach to engage your employee workforce and um, do that in a way that doesn't require an account, doesn't require a download or a separate app. And then the last piece I'd highlight here is we do offer something to the employee as well, that we're able to provide them with that uh, verified vac vaccination uh, data back to them. And they have the ability to download that and store it securely in their wallet. Um, and we have a number of different uh, methods of making that uh, available to them, but it is something that increasingly has been uh, of value to our, our existing uh, clients and members. Um, and we know that it will be valuable um, uh, as people start navigating this process as well. Um, that's really what, what I wanted to, to touch on. I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to David and we can um, love to hear your questions for sure. Super. I've stopped sharing the screen. We have a bunch of very interesting questions. The first one is for Delphine. When do you expect them to come back uh, uh, with the mandate or the ETS from OSHA? When do you think OSHA will finally promulgate the um, mm -hmm. Yes. So on September 9th, is it a couple weeks? So, you know, couples usually two. Uh, so that would be 14 days. So that's why we are hoping this week or next week. We know that the administration is very focused on getting this out quickly so that it aligns um, in with the with the government contractor mandate and, and also to bend the curve on COVID infections. So I would say look today. Usually announcements aren't made on Fridays. So I would really focus next, early next week for an announcement. Um, and just for his context, the ETS is, is different than the usual rulemaking structure, and that's why they use the ETS. Usually it takes about seven years for a rule to go through the process, so that's why they've used the ETS. So the short answer is 
should be, I, I would put my money on next week. Okay, great. So we have a bunch of questions for Dr. Lucan here. Um, I'm gonna combine the first two. Um, uh, this has to do, Dr. Lucan, with the uh, curve, the antigen, uh, 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 the curve that you discussed. The question is, first, is the testing curve accurate for Delta? And then the second question on top of that is, what is the curve the same for unvaccinated people who contract illness and vaccinated people who contract illness? So one is, is this a curve reflective on Delta? And then the second question is, do people who are vaccinated behave differently with respect to contagion? And should we kind of, uh, you know, I guess the, the implication is you kind of change your, um, your policy around testing on a vaccinated versus unvaccinated. Sure. Yeah. I mean, those are excellent questions and, um, you know, really speak to sort of the variability uh, in coronavirus in general and particularly with the new variants that are emerging. So um, the curve that was presented is meant only to be a, a guide and sort of a, um, you know, a, a rough outline of how things can occur. There's enormous amount of individual variability, um, certainly with uh, Delta in particular. We know that people become uh, develop higher viral loads sooner, become infectious earlier, and remain infectious longer. Um, we also know that uh, vaccination status matters quite a bit. Um, so vaccinated people are very much less likely to be infected, very much, much less likely uh, to spread it. Uh, and we know that pretty convincingly from both laboratory data and real world data um, you know, from uh, countries around the uh, around the globe, but um, so so the curve should be taken with a grain of salt. But but I mean the so the specifics of the numbers and the the numerical values are sort of less important than the shape of the curve, which I think holds in any scenario. And understanding that you know a testing strategy, regardless of which one you choose, is going to have implications about, based on whether someone is um, uh, infectious yet actively contagious or recovered and where you're getting the results and what, uh, what, the, um, what the results mean for um, uh, managing workers and you know, figuring out what to do for the business. But you have, as I understand, I mean, this isn't a question, but for clarification, you have experiences, I understand, around using the rapid testing methodology in large institutional situations, correct? Right. In yes. terms of, I mean, maybe we'll just take a second on that. I mean, I think you've worked with schools and the like. I mean, mm -hmm. this is uh, the, 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 the testing of, often with antigens you, you have implemented elsewhere and have found it to be much more useful and less uh, disruptive. I, I think antigen testing, uh, I, I'm personally a strong advocate for antigen testing. I think it's the way to go. Um, I think the advantages of it um, sort of speak for themselves. So the fact that it is rapid, it can identify cases immediately in the moment when you want to know the information and it tells you about what you want to know, which is contagiousness, not presence of virus that might be totally inconsequential. Um, what I put on the slide was just a scenario that I had proposed. Um, you know, this was for, uh, th that slide was actually a holdover from a school-based webinar I had done back in the spring. Um, so it was an option for a school. Um, with antigen testing, more is better. So um, that was a thrice weekly option, which is pretty good. Uh, a daily option would be even better. Antigen testing is very cheap. Um, it is, uh, especially compared to PCR, I mean, prices vary now and they're, you know, it, it matters a lot by modality, but we're talking like orders of magnitude difference. So, you know, an average PCR might be somewhere in the neighborhood of you know, 150 to 250 or, you know, more or less, depending on negotiation power. Uh, antigen testings are on the order of, you know, $5 to $20. Uh, you can get full purchasing down to just a, a couple bucks. Um, so there are real economies there. Um, and I, I, I think the epidem epidemiology uh, kind of speaks for itself. Yeah, that's, you know, just on a personal note, I have a, a couple of kids in school in the UK, and basically the NHS provides every home for tests enough to test every kid twice a week with an antigen test. And that's be no masks, by the way, just antigen testing uh, uh, every two weeks. So what about the next question regarding uh, 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 vaccinated versus unvaccinated people who 
uh, you know, bre- how to break through people, ge- breakthrough cases generally behave with respect to contagion. I have seen some studies. It's a great question because I've seen some emerging studies that vaccinated people tend to be contagious for a shorter period of time. Is that pa- is that panning out? Is that kind of a, a, a true statement? And if so, would you treat at the work site a vaccinated person who may have a breakthrough infection a little bit differently than the vac- than the unvaccinated person? Yeah, it's an excellent question. I, you know, I, and I think there's been a lot of, um, I, I think a lot of the messaging around this has been less than ideal. So it is unequivocally the case that vaccinated people are less likely to get infected, less likely to spread infection. Um, we So early data from the CDC sort of raised alarm bells, I think largely because of the way it was communicated that uh, the amount of virus in people's nasopharynx uh, between vaccinated and unvaccinated people was similar. That may be true, but it was a cross-sectional slice. Subsequent studies have come out, um, I think most compellingly from the Netherlands that showed that even though the amount of virus is there, the virus is not live or culturable, meaning it's not transmissible. It's not of consequence, it's just sort of dead virus. So vaccinated people rapidly inactivate the virus and shut it down before it can spread. Uh, and data from Singapore you know, pretty much um, reinforces that in terms of real world um, uh, data on contagiousness. So vaccinated people were less likely to spread it on. Now, does that have implications for your screening protocols and for um, you know, testing? Absolutely. In fact, you know, I'm facing this right now personally just with my son's hockey team. So half the team is vaccinated, half are not. We have a case on the team and what to do about that. Um, and you know, the same thing holds for hockey teams or schools or businesses. Uh, vaccinated people currently under CDC guidance, and I think it makes sense and is uh, holds up to the science, uh, should be exempt from screening protocols. However, vaccinated people can get infected and can have breakthrough infections. And if they are exposed, there is, um, uh, there is the recommendation that they test. So they don't have to quarantine, but they do have to test three to five days after exposure. So that's okay, another so, testing opportunity. Yeah. So that's comfort for employers who have a wholly 100% vaccinated workforce. They don't have to go through routine screening unless there's history of a direct contact. Correct. And I, I should also note that other evolution in thought, and you mentioned uh, kids in the UK, the UK has been very progressive in this way. Um, in terms of quarantine and quarantine requirements. So it's not the case as in past years that, or, or in the early part of the pandemic, that uh, in cases where we would have sent workers home or you know, quarantined entire units or had shutdowns, that that's necessarily what is needed in the current state of affairs, especially with antigen testing. So an alternative to that is if you were, as an alternative to quarantine, let's say you were concerned that people were exposed uh, and quarantine is really an information problem. It's really saying, you know, we, we have people are exposed. We don't know if they are infected or are going to be infected. So one thing we can do is, is test them regularly. Uh, and so an alternative to sending workers home or having a shutdown is to just do a, a daily antigen test, a daily, you know, every morning before you come into work or as soon as you arrive, you do a rapid antigen test. If it's positive, if it's negative, you stay for the day. If it's positive, you go home and isolate like you would any other time. All right. Um, well, that's a very interesting thought. Quarantine is an information problem. Great. Uh, there, so here's the third question for you. What are your thoughts on rapid antigen testing for vaccinated uh, employees prior to large events? So this is the issue of everybody's vaccinated. You're going to have a large event at your company. Should you test everybody in advance or just bag it? Right. So, um, so my personal, well, so I, I can say I've seen a lot of companies and schools doing this differently. Uh, and, um, you know, so I've done some work with the performing arts uh, venues and, and uh, theater district, and there they are testing everyone, vaccinated or not. Um, is that, you know, based in science or good reason? Perhaps not, but, um, you know, the downside may be limited, especially for a one time event. I think, you know, the potential implications of, you know, doing questionable science um, are less uh, pronounced if it's a one-time event versus like a weekly screening. Um, so I don't, I, I, I could go either way on it. I, I don't think that it's indicated. 
uh, sometimes, you know, there are issues of equity and fairness and perception and risk and, you know, people's concern about, you know, breakthrough infections, which I think is a really unfortunate term that we could discuss uh, at another time. But um, uh, the bottom line is uh, people are doing it differently. Um, and uh, I've seen the, the full gamut. Okay, next one's for Greg. How do you use, um, how, or, or David, but let's try Greg first. How do, you, how do you get those using an antigen test to provide proof to the employer of the test result? I mean, we've talked about this so yeah. much here at EHE. How do you get it into the system, basically? Yeah, it really depends. You know, there are some, the, the attributes on testing and all of that that Dr. Lucan was speaking about earlier, you know, the, the, the variety of tests that are out there now, there are different mechanisms for doing that. For, for some, it's, it's as simple as uh, providing image proof and getting it into the appropriate recipient, either at the uh, organization, uh, the way we've been doing it with some clients we work with is having a, a, an email work stream. It sort of flows through that uh, so it can get populated um, and tracked. Uh, other uh, tests do have ways for that uh, information to be collected electronically, connects to a, an app on the phone, uh, those types of things. Um, some, some might be, and this will you know, sort of depend on how these uh, regulations come forth, um, it may just be as simple as an attestation that I have tested and I'm negative. You know? uh, any of those things could be uh, ways for that to happen here. And then certainly where testing is being performed at the work location, that testing provider, uh, you know, that team uh, can do the tracking and, and delivery of the results. Okay, great. I want to get back to Delphine in just a minute, because I know she has a question. I want to talk about this attestation thing. But first, let's I have a couple of other questions uh, uh, more on the medical side. Uh, Greg, somebody just says, like, where do you buy tests and how do you get them? <laughs> uh, well, uh, you, yeah, the tests are all over. There's over-the-counter tests. They're they're available in pharmacy stores, um, and you know there are some good quality rapid tests that are available over the counter. Uh, when you're talking about buying in bulk, there are testing providers. Um, you know, uh, we work with clients to help them procure tests, but there are standalone providers. Uh, you can work with uh, certain tests an employer can procure on their own. There might be situations where they cannot procure because that test requires uh, a physician order or something along those lines. Uh, but there's a lot of different mechanisms for that. If that individual wants to reach out, I'm happy to you know, give them some ideas and thoughts. Okay, great. Um, the next one, back to Dr. Lucan. What type of health and safety measures are important in a vaccinated only building? Is social distancing and masking and or testing necessary? Yeah, so, so most critically, I think um, for buildings in general, um, coronavirus or otherwise, uh, filtration and ventilation, that's number one. Um, that's uh, by far the most protective measure for coronavirus and other respiratory viruses and just worker health in general. Um, Beyond that, uh, if it's, I'm sorry, the question was for vaccinated only. only yeah, so look, we have a workforce here at DHE. We don't screen yes. and test because we're 100% vaccinated. Sure. So we look at that data very closely and we obviously make decisions. And I know other employers don't feel that way. And some people are kind of in between. Uh, you know, we think we're doing the right thing, but I mean, is there any additional guidance? You know, because maybe it's not the right thing. You know, we have a very open space. It's very sparsely populated. You know, this is not people, uh, you know, in a, 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 in a plant situation where people are breathing down each other's necks and stuff like that. I mean, is there any further guidance on wholly vaccinated populations in a variety of business settings, buildings and or other enclosed areas? Yeah, so, so like I said, I, I think most important is ventilation filtration. I mean, airflow is what's critical. Um, you know, spacing is also important, but I think really the question cannot be answered without the context of understanding local transmission rates. So it's really about how much virus is out there and what the absolute risk is. Um, so, you know, if you're in, you know, rural Maine, it's a little different than if you're in, you know, uh, uh, you know urban Mississippi. Um, so I would say that uh, in the context of low viral transmission and otherwise safe, uh, you know, sort of reassuring community numbers, um, you know, airflow is uh, important. And then beyond that, I, I don't think you need it. I mean, obviously hand hygiene and other things that you would do um, in terms of, uh, 
you know, uh, just just uh, health and safety overall. But um, I don't think uh, masks are necessary. I don't think, um, you know, any particular distancing is necessary. I don't think you need to have restrictions on number of uh, people or groups. Um, I'm trying to think of what other measures. Um, training. That, that sounds like going back to a normal life. Yeah, it sounds like going back to normal life, right? Which is what we could have achieved if right. we had gotten the vaccination rates that right. we were hoping to, and if people can. So you're, what you're describing yeah. is 100% vaccination. That's yeah. fantastic, right? Yeah. But again, it depends. But because you know, vaccinated people then go out to live in their you know mixed worlds with vaccinated, unvaccinated, sort of intermingling. Uh, you know, it, it depends a lot on the community transmission rates. Um, but at some point, you know, coronavirus is going to recede. I mean, it's never going to go away, but it will recede and come in waves and come and go. And it will get to a point where it is, you know, the the um, the numbers are low enough that all of us can go back to something, you know, resembling, you know, uh, much more resembling what we think of as normal or pre-pandemic normal. Okay, great. Delphine, so I know you had uh, some an, an additional question that you wanted to ask, but also I, if you could touch on this issue, because we face it a lot here about uh, proof uh, uh, or auditable proof and the idea of how does self-attestation, uh, uh, on whom the obligation is for, for, for proof uh, depend, and how does self-attestation work as an avenue to keeping employers basically off the hook for you know, making an authentication uh, chain quite quite difficult, frankly. Um, yeah, great. So, great question. And first, I'll say, you know, I wish that everybody could hear when we talk about misinformation. I mean, I don't think there's enough conversation about ventilation and air quality. Mass, mass, mass. I mean, that is a, just a wish, a message that we could just push out. And when you're thinking about as an employer, your obligations, it's not just about this obligation, the ETS under OSHA, air filtration, ventilation, those are already existing obligations, legal obligations that you have as an employer. So really critical to think about those. Those aren't just nice to haves, but things that um, you should be prepared for an audit of your air quality. Not really something that's been a focus in let's say financial institutions, Historically, now it will be. Uh, to your question, David, that's that's you know it's how much how, you can. So there are legal ways in in your contracting in your documents. You can craft language that says the obligation. You know you're fully relying in providing this attestation. Everything that you're saying is is truthful. You understand the risk that lying basically would would have on others. You understand that lying in this attestation would have disciplinary implications. Important to have those policies in place. If you find out someone's been lying, what's the what are the consequences? You know, anything that you can do to A, communicate to your employees that you are relying on their statement and it's part of your employee handbook. You know, you are, um, when they're attesting that they understand the implications. As an employer, it's not enough to say, oh, okay, well, we're just gonna say it's, we have to rely on it. You need to be reasonable in your actions. If you're just saying, okay, yes, it's all on the employee, but not really doing anything to follow up or audit, it creates more risk. So as you indicated, part of the vaccination cards is, you know, they're easy to forge, you know? Um, so more information that you can include, I would randomly audit them uh, to the extent possible and see also just does somebody say, you know, every week they're including the same information at the same time? I would do some, you know, spot checks so that as an employer, you're fulfilling your obligation and not vulnerable to, well, head in the sand. I told them they needed to attest, so they should have attested, okay? Um, the other piece, and this relates to my question, is um, employers are concerned about the flu. And that's going to go into, I think, the attestation is we're hearing we're going to have a crazy flu season. And I'm hearing, well, OK, how are we going to how are we going to track testing 
vaccination, religious accommodations, disability, I have the flu, maybe it's cold, it's a cold, you know, just all of this. And I would say that, you know, when you're thinking about this, both from a clinical perspective and from a compliance and operational perspective, the flu is whether rightly or wrongly creating a lot of confusion and anxiety over how am I as an employer going to know, and I would argue that you don't really need to know, uh, whether it's the flu or, or COVID. Um, so would a flu come up as COVID in any of these tests? Because there's some talk chatter out there that a flu could be misdiagnosed by some of these tests. Sean? So uh, there are some combination tests that companies are developing that will test for panels of respiratory viruses, including uh, flu, RSV, um, and some other coronaviruses, I believe. There is, uh, I think, precisely zero chance that influenza or being positive with influenza and influenza alone will turn a coronavirus test positive. That said, uh, people often are infected with multiple respiratory viruses at once, and there's pretty compelling evidence of that. So it's possible that they could um, be co-infected with two viruses at the same time. Um, from a public health standpoint, though, and a worker safety standpoint, it, it almost doesn't matter whether someone has coronavirus or flu. I mean, you don't want them in the building. I mean, any infectious, but like, you know, flu kills people too. Uh, and we should, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, you know, uh, you know, people often dismiss flu as uh, only, you know, it's only a flu. Well, only a flu is the sixth leading cause of death in this country. Okay, I, I got one more question, but I just want to add a comment to, to that. I think, Sean, as it, Dr. Lugan, as it relates to your uh, presentation, you can imagine that if somebody had uh, coronavirus three or four months ago, got the flu, but still had a positive PCR three or four months down the road, boom, you've just walked into a misdiagnosis situation, you know, and that's, you know, that's really where you get into trouble. I mean, yeah. in, a, in, in a fairly big way. Well, that's where the rapid antigen though can be differentiating right. and saving, right? I mean, it, it's the, it's about which test you choose and it, choose and in what situation and you, right. know, you can't let clinical medicine, you know, fly out the window too. You need, I mean, not to, not to get into technicalities, but I mean, a doctor will know about pre-test probability and what the, you know, likelihood is and, you know, which test to, to order. Okay, I got 30 seconds left and we have to leave. I'm sorry to do this to you, David Booza, but the question is, how ready is your system? And is it all really there to deploy? I mean, I, go ahead. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So certainly to, to, to Delphine's point, we are waiting for some of these rules, um, but we, we've been doing this from the, the beginning of the pandemic, um, capturing test data, putting that in dashboards to employers. Um, the piece that we've uh, we've added um, is that ability to engage with an employee um, to get that permission to ac uh, access their vaccination status. Um, but even that piece um, is something that we've been doing for uh, several months now for our existing members. There, um, uh, I think at last count, we've had over a thousand of our own uh, EHE members um, in our total population health program. Uh, that have gone on to our MyEG platform, um, consented, and we've pulled their vaccination records down from the, the state um, in which they were vaccinated. So all of those components are there. The piece we're looking to do is really bring that, uh, how do I engage uh, 10, 15, 18, 20, 30,000 employees in an efficient manner where I can bring that all back to an employer? We've, we've done that on the testing side. We're just adding that um, piece to allow that uh, vaccination status to be captured in a in an audible manner. Great, super. This has been a fantastic webcast. I have to tell you, I learned so much. Delphine, thank you. Greg, thank you. Sean, welcome to the company. Thank you. Great job. David, thank you. Uh, and of course, we're always here. Uh, uh, you uh, reach out to us for any questions. Have a good weekend, everybody. And thank you for taking the time. Thanks, everyone.